Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Sean Powers, and I'm a policy manager at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL, and I manage JPAL's education program. This is the third in a series of research webinars showcasing new evaluations by JPAL affiliated professors. In this and other webinars, we'll be discussing ongoing work, so the results here are preliminary. You can access more updated results as they become available, as well as published papers and policy summaries on the evaluations page of our website, povertyactionlab.org slash evaluations. Today's webinar features Kartik Moralideran, a professor at the University of California, San Diego, and an affiliate of JPAL. Kartik's research interests explore topics such as education, health, and social protection, as well as measuring quality of public service delivery, program evaluation, and improving the effectiveness of public spending with a focus on developing countries. In this webinar, he discusses recent research on the School Choice Project in Andhra Pradesh, India. This is ongoing work with Venkatesh Sundara Raman of the World Bank. A brief note before we start, we had some technical difficulties with the recording, so the recording will cut in during the introduction of Kartik's first slide. Thanks very much again for joining us today, and here's Kartik. Demand for English as well as poor perceived public school performance. Uh, and these numbers are going up rapidly. I think it's estimated at growing at about 1% a year on the rural sample that Pratham puts out. I think in the most recent data, uh, the rural private school share in India is about 29, uh, 29%, and the urban shares are considerably higher. Okay. Uh, now, it's not the case that this increase in private school enrollment is taking place uh, because the public sector is withdrawing. Um, if anything, this is a context of increasing public school school spending. Uh, this has been a time of the universal education campaign, a threefold increase in the per capita education budget in the past decade, and greater investments in access and input based markers quality across the board. Uh, so the question is, what is going on? And why are uh, families moving and migrating to private schools? So one um, candidate explanation is that uh, the public school system is quite inefficient at converting spending into outcomes. And so this is something I have done a lot of work on, um, including measuring high rates of teacher absence, um, as well as documenting the lack of translating spending into outcomes. And so this is one possible reason. But uh, we don't understand many important things about private schools. And in particular, uh, the, the growth of private schools is highly controversial. So at one end, you have supporters who argue that private schools are more accountable, that they're more responsive and cost effective, uh, that the, the revealed preference of parents, I mean, suggests that they must be better because parents are choosing to pay out of pocket uh, for these private schools and foregoing what is free public schooling. And in some cases, it's not just free, but you could argue that it has a negative price because of free, free midday meals and free books and uniforms. And so there's additional free stuff that comes with public schooling and parents are, uh, are kind of, uh, voting with their feet to pay out of pocket to go to private school. And this is a view that would suggest that policy should do more to leverage private production of schooling. Uh, on the other hand, you have very important reasons to be worried about the growth of private schools. And I think uh, perhaps the biggest one is just the economic stratification of schooling and what that does in terms of uh, uh, segmenting society and so by socioeconomic uh, status and ability to pay. Um, there's a concern of worsening of public schools because of elite secession and moving to private schools. There's a concern that these private schools are low quality um, and that they're basically just attracting parents by marketing and that poor and illiterate parents are, uh, are not equipped to make, make good choices. Okay. So in particular, I think a concern of private schools is that they function on the basis of selecting high ability students and that because they're not they're not obliged to take everybody, uh, that they attract high ability students, and then they try to attract others on the basis of better levels of test scores, um, even though they may not add more value. So there's now multiple studies, at least four different studies from different parts of the world, um, in China, in Kenya, in Chicago, Boston, New York, and all of these studies seem to find that if you compare the marginal child who's in the government school, who kind of is on below a cutoff, and with a child who's above the cutoff and goes to a private school, uh, that on average, there's no difference in performance. And so what this would suggest is if you look at the cross-sectional differences, if you just look at any survey of test scores, um, and 
you'll see that the private schools appear to do much better. So they score higher on Telugu and math, but their parents are also more likely to be educated, and the parents are typically richer, less likely to be from backward past. And so the fundamental question becomes that are these differences that we observe in test scores between public and private schools, are they all driven by socioeconomic pedigree of households, or is there something to it in terms of private schools being more effective? Now, the reason this becomes particularly relevant in the Indian policy context is that the Government of India's recent Right to Education Act um, has a landmark provision of mandating that private schools reserve up to 25% of their seats for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and that the government will reimburse the fees up to the per child spending in public schools. Um, and this system may well create the world's largest program of publicly funded attendance of private schools. Um, but on the other hand, it's also perhaps the largest attempt at school integration across economic classes ever seen in the world, because the idea here is that all private schools uh, would accept 25% of their places, uh, would fill 25% with students from economically weaker sections with the government reimbursing fees. Okay, so as you can imagine, this is a massive change contemplated to the schooling system, but there's no evidence whatsoever on what the impact of such a provision would be. And in particular, it's not clear um, that if poor disadvantaged kids will do better in these private schools, and the spillovers and students left behind in the public schools and those starting out in the private schools is the other key concern. So uh, the concerns from private schools that this would dilute the quality of their schooling has made this provision highly controversial and contested all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, so it's extremely contentious, but there's very little evidence, and that's kind of what this project is trying to do. Okay? Um, so just a small pause. Sean, is that pace fine? Are you hearing me fine? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so what's the AP School Choice Project? It's designed to answer several open questions in the global literature on school choice and public and private schooling in general, but especially relevant to India given the RTD context. Um, it's the first randomized experiment of school choice in a low-income country. Um, it features a two-stage randomization that creates both an individual and a market-level experiment which allows us to simulate a counterfactual school system in the absence of the program. And I'll show you a picture that explains exactly how this works. And it's a large long-term study with perhaps the most comprehensive data collected of intermediate factors in any study on school choice, and I'll show you that in a second. Okay. So here's a picture that's important to keep in mind, and what this shows you is what the typical experimental design for school choice study looks like, okay? And this is already way, way, way better than simply comparing across public and private schools, and what this design shows you is that in a typical voucher program, you have kids one, two, and three start out in the private schools, okay, in groups one, two, and three in the public schools, and kids in group four start out in the private schools. Now, when you have a voucher program, typically the way it will work is you will have families apply for this voucher, and the group that does not apply is group one, okay? So those are the non-applicants who are not interested in applying for the voucher. And groups two and three are the kids who apply, and then you have a lottery. So that lottery is that line between group two and group three, and the winners of the lottery, who are group three, will take this voucher and go to a private school, and they move and join the kids in group four. Okay, and the way the comparison will work is it will compare group three versus group two because the idea is saying that conditional and applying, the lottery means that there's no difference on average between group two and group three, and as a result, any impact on test scores over a period of time can be purely attributed to what's going on in the private school as opposed to the public school, okay? So this is the standard state-of-the-art design, and most of the studies, pretty much all the studies done so far, uh, even in the U.S. and other parts of the world, rely on a design like this. Now, this is a very good design, but there's still a couple of limitations. And the first limitation is the fact that the kids who are left behind in the public school, that's group two, which constitutes your control group, is not in fact a business as usual control. And that's because if the most motivated kids have left and gone to the private school, you worry that the pure effects of uh, the motivated kids leaving is gonna have an adverse effect on the kids who are left behind um, in group one and group two. Now, the flip side is that if the, if the public school has a competitive response to the voucher program, then there might be an improvement in performance. And so, however you look at it, there's some factors that bias you upwards, some that bias you downwards, but group two is not an uncontaminated control group the way you would like it to be, 
Problem number two is group one, who are the kids left behind in the public school. And in the U.S., this has been the big worry, that the kids left behind will do worse once these most motivated kids are and then problem three is group four, okay, which are the kids in the private school. And so you might believe that if you get an influx of underprepared kids from the public schools, that there might be negative effects on the kids who start out in the private school. And this is the part that the opposition in India, the opposition to the program, has been most worried about. And that's why they've taken the issue with the court. Now, how is our design going to address this problem? And the way we address this is by using a two-stage experiment, and that's where we get the title from. And the idea here is to use the fact that villages in India are close to being closed economies for school choice. So kids don't travel that far out of the village for primary schooling. Now, of course, you will travel a little bit, but there is a very strong correlation between distance and where you go. And so what this means is that we can randomize at the village level. So what we do is just like any other voucher program, we invite applicants for the scholarship, and that's group one, okay? Now, but this is happening in all of 150 villages, okay? So before we do the program, we have done baseline tests in every school in every one of 180 villages, which is, uh, which is the universe of the program. We then go and invite applications for the, for the voucher programs. I'm going to use scholarship and voucher interchangeably because the parents understand the term scholarship better, but there's nothing merit-based about this, okay? So in that sense, it is a voucher. Um, and so you get the applications, you get group one, but then what you do is you have a village-level lot, okay, whereby you randomize half the villages, the ones in orange, into the treatment, and the other half of the villages continue as the control group. So what you have in the treatment villages then is a second lottery, which is if you're in a treatment village, we then run another lottery to see if you, the child, will get the will get the voucher. Okay. So the the top of this picture, which is the orange boxes, look exactly like a standard voucher experiment. What's new is the bottom of the picture, where you also have the control villages. So notice now that group two C is going to be an uncontaminated control group. Why is this? Because they applied for the voucher, but they did not get it by lottery. But because this is a village level lottery, you don't see a group 3C, and so nobody has in fact left these schools, okay? So you get a business as usual school system. Now, similarly, if I want to look at the spillovers, you can study group 1T versus 1C and 4T versus 4C, and you get the estimates of what is happening as a spillover to the kids in the private schools who receive this influx of voucher kids, and similarly, the estimates on what happened to kids left behind in the public school. Okay, so this picture really just summarizes the key aspects of the design, and most of the comparisons I'm going to give you, unless I tell you, are going to compare the treatment villages with the controlled villages, so that we're using an uncontaminated control group. Okay, so the fundamental research questions we're going after are, what changes do these voucher-winning kids experience when they switch to a private school, at the school level, at the teacher level, at the household level? What is the impact of providing economically disadvantaged kids with a voucher to attend a private school? Are private schools more effective? And are they more productive? And those are two different things, which I'll come to in a second. How does the impact of the program vary by individual school and market characteristics? And are there spillover effects on kids left behind and the kids who start out in the private school to begin? Okay, so the implementation partners, this was a project, it's a very ambitious project with many partners um, implemented by the Arun Energy Foundation, a leading nonprofit in India, who has part of an MOU with the government of Andhra Pradesh and the World Bank to create these Andhra Pradesh randomized evaluation studies, which have been going on now for over eight years as probably the largest and most, you know, longest lasting series of experimental research programs in education. Uh, the School Choice Project was financed by the Lagarum Foundation and the Lagarum Institute with additional support from the World Bank in Britain, um, and staff from the Alvin Prenji Foundation kind of were the frontline uh, implementation staff. So the entire project on the ground was implemented after it was implemented by the Prenji Foundation in partnership with the government. Uh, but the important caveat here is what I'm presenting here are academic results that represent the independent analysis of the academic PIs, but they do not represent the official views of any of the organizations, okay? Um, and as Sean said, I mean, this is work in progress, and it's not been formally peer-reviewed at this point, but we have gotten a lot of inputs from global experts, and so we are pretty confident the results are all stable at this point, okay? So 
The key program features, I'm going to kind of skip this, but I put it out there so you can go back and look at the, and just look at the slides if you want to. Uh, it's done across five districts in BC, uh, and the main terms and conditions of the program were that it's completely voluntary. A household can always go back to the public school. There's no conditions. Uh, and the scholarship covered all the school fees, books, and uniforms, but it did not cover transport. Um, and midday meals because the private schools don't provide school lunches um, and we didn't, uh, it wasn't feasible for us to provide transport independently on the project. But it's important that the household did not see any cash or vouchers. The payments were made directly to the schools, okay? Um, on the school side, there's a parallel communication process that happens with the private schools. Um, you have to, we do this in villages that have at least one recognized private school. And again, it's completely voluntary. And the fees were set by the foundation to be at the 90th percentile of the distribution of private school fees. So one question in these pro programs is, how do you set the fees given that there's so much variation across private schools? And so we set the number here so that it will cover marginal costs for all schools and that nobody would feel uh, that they were obliged uh, to take on kids. And this, this amount was about now about 60 to $65 a day. So the schools were asked if they want to participate in the program. And if so, how many seats they could offer the scholarship students. So the important thing here is there's theoretical evidence to show that voucher programs don't work or you lose a lot of the benefits if the schools are cherry picking the kids. Okay, So the schools are not allowed to cherry pick the kids. And the protocols are just like charter school protocols. Okay, So essentially, if you have excess demand in a given school, then we also lot of the kids into that school. But in practice, the schools were happy to just take whoever wanted to go there. So that ended up not being a constraint. There's also uh, a condition that the schools cannot charge pop-up fees, and the fees are paid to them directly by the foundation. Uh, so the framing and the communication to the schools was the, the RTE Act, the Right to Education Clause that I talked about, the draft of this has been around since 2005. So when we start the project in 2008, everybody knows that this is pro probably going to show up as a law, and so that made the communication uh, kind of pretty seamless because everybody understood that this was a research project that was feeding with understanding what the impact of this would be, but at the same time, the low stakes for the individual schools, and they were there was no compulsion on, uh, on any of that. So uh, the summary stats, uh, about 6,433 kids applied to these vouchers across the villages. 90 villages were randomized in treatment, 90 to control. Uh, close to 2,000 kids were awarded the voucher within the treatment villages. Um, and about 60% of them took it up and went and joined the private school. Okay? So, and, and this is important. It's important because it shows that the parents are not blindly saying that we always want to go to the private school. This is not about saying private is better or government is better. It really is just about giving parents a choice and seeing what they will pick. Uh, and so 60, uh, 40 percent of them were happy to stay on. And in fact, only 40 percent even applied in the first place. So all put together, uh, the take up rate is in the range of about 35 percent. Okay. Uh, now, the, the good news is that there's no difference in take up between uh, by SES and CAS. So one of the things people worry about with private schools is this, that this is exacerbating inequality because even not only across households, but even within households, households are more willing to pay to send their boys uh, to private schools. Uh, but one of the hopes of a voucher program is that you level that playing field by removing the financial constraints of the private school. And in the program, we don't see any difference in take up by gender, SES, or CAS. Uh, but it is strongly negatively correlated with distance, as we might expect. So the further away the nearest private school is, the less likely you are to pick up the program. Okay, so um, Sean, I'm going to go to about 9.35, 38, since we started late. Okay, so I'm going to take a few minutes more um, and just go through stuff quickly. So the main, uh, the so let's just kind of walk through the main results, and I've got the tables in there as well. So what we see is on process variables, the private schools do better on most characteristics of infrastructure, and especially in terms of teacher-student contact time. So the private schools have a longer school day, a longer school year, um, lower pupil-teacher ratios, and much lower rates of multi-grade teaching, better school hygiene, um, and they have significantly higher overall management scores, and this is mostly driven by their teacher personnel policies in terms of hiring and retention. But, but uh, the private school teachers are much poorer on measures of input quality. So uh, they have lower levels of education, training, experience, and much lower salaries. So if you measure teacher quality by looking at inputs, you might think that uh, the teachers are much, much worse. But on the other hand, they have much better measures of effort. So there's lower absence, higher rates of active teaching, and 
you know, the other part of this that's important is it's possible that a voucher program induces a lot of change in household inputs, in which case the real change might be coming not because of the school, because the changes that the school is inducing in the household. So we collect an enormous amount of data on household spending, household time use, and overall it looks like uh, the school time goes up, but time spent on homework does not, okay? And that's an important finding by itself because it shows you that the cultural capital in the household has not changed, and I'll show you that picture. So changes in outcomes to the that we find are likely to be driven by what's going on in the school. Okay, so here's then some uh, simple figures. Um, I'll go through this quickly, but you can go to the paper, which is on my website and on the JPAL website, and go and find these tables. Uh, but uh, these are just numbers backing up what I just told you. Okay, so the, uh, the working days is about two weeks a year, uh, longer working days in the private schools. The pupil teacher ratios are some considerably lower. Uh, and they do better on most measures of infrastructure, toilets, and fan fiction, uh, except for the functional radio, which is something the government tends to have for government-sponsored radio instruction program. Uh, on teacher-level inputs, again, you see that on teacher quality as measured by inputs, the public schools seem to do much, much better. Uh, the teachers are more experienced, they're more eager to teaching, they're more likely to complete a college or master's degree, and they're much more likely to have formal teacher training. Okay, so. I don't have a pointer to point to these things, but you can just go down that, uh, that table and see it. Uh, but on the other hand, the private school teachers are more likely to come from the same village, and they're paid much lower salaries. Okay, so just focus on that last row. Uh, and it's kind of stunning that public school teachers are paid about six, seven times more. And in fact, this is a lower bound because I'm not counting the discounted value of the pension payments. And so once you count that, uh, the difference is perhaps more like a factor of eight. Okay, uh, this is then measures of school level indicators. So like I said, you see that the private schools have lower, uh, higher rates of active teaching, lower rates of teacher absence, higher rates of teachers being in control of the class, much higher rates of teachers being in, uh, maintaining discipline in the class. So, and this is measured by independent surprise visits to the school. So over the four years of the project, the project team keeps on making surprise visits. So this is again, uh, observational data collected by direct physical observation. And so on every process measure, okay, the private school looks like it's doing better. And then this is on the household input side. So uh, again, it, I, I would take a, I would need a lot of time to go through this in detail, but focus on column three, this is column seven, okay? So column three shows you what is the typical difference between a public school kid and a private school kid. And column seven is the same difference, but between a lottery winning kid who went to the private school and the lottery losing kid who stayed in the public school. So when you compare column three and seven, it's telling you to what extent did the voucher program get kids to catch up with the behavior of a typical private school student. And you notice in the first row that they have completely caught up in time spent in school. So the typical kid spends about 45 minutes a day more in school, in the private school, that's column three, and you see that the voucher kids are doing exactly the same. Okay. On the other hand, the typical private school kid does about 25 minutes a day extra of homework uh, whereas if you look at the voucher winning kids, I mean, there, there's no significant difference. And so that was my point, that you see that there isn't a catch-up on the home factors, but there is a catch-up on the school factors. So if you go down to the third last row, you'll see the typical private school kid spends about 20 minutes a day less playing with friends, whereas the voucher winning kid, uh, there's no difference there at all. Okay, so it's, 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 uh, it's a really interesting thing, but go look at the paper for more. So let's focus now on learning outcomes, which is really uh, the, the main focus of the project. And what we see is that in spite of the private schools supposedly being better on measures of process, that we find no test score impacts whatsoever on the two main subjects, which are math and Telugu, which is the native language in other British. Okay, so, so the natural inference here is that the difference I showed you in the beginning between private and public schools are mostly driven by variations in SES and not by variation in the school effectiveness. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, so that's a very important result because, you know, all of this cross-sectional difference would then suggest, uh, you know, it would suggest that this is not being driven by school productivity. But it still seemed quite puzzling, okay, because the puzzling is because from all our process data and everything we looked at, it really did look that the private schools were, you know, having more time on task and more, uh, more uh, in teaching activity. And so then somebody in a seminar casually mentioned that, you know, maybe these private schools are doing different things. And so what we did was we then went and looked at the school timetable data. So this happened after the two years. So it's a four-year project. We tested at the end of two years and four years. Um, 
And what we found is that the private schools, in fact, spend much less instructional time on these subjects. And instead, they use that extra time to teach more English, Hindi, and EDS, which is environmental sciences, which is a hybrid of science and social studies. So then what we do at the end of year four is we go and test in all subjects, and you find that there's positive effects in all of these. Uh, it's insignificant for English and EDS. It's kind of the key stats between 1.3 and 1.6, so we call it positive but not significant. Uh, but it's large and significant for him. Okay, um, and then when you average across all the subjects, you find significant positive effects um, of uh, 0.13 standard deviations of winning the voucher and 0.23 of taking the voucher and going to the private school. But you know, it's important to highlight that this is not, in fact, such a big number. Okay, I mean, relative to other interventions, I mean, and also remember, there's no gains in maths and Telugu, which are the two main subjects, and the gains are coming on Hindi, which is not, in fact, taught in the public school. So the problem here is, how do you weight these different subjects, okay? So it's in, in the it's one view is that the most important thing is math and telephone, and that the weight on Hindi should be zero, because there's no point learning three languages badly, as opposed to kind of knowing one language really well. In that case, I mean, you would say that the private schools are not more effective at all, okay? Uh, on the other hand, you might believe that the market returns to something like English and Hindi are higher, because Hindi allows you access to a national labor market in terms of migration, as well as being able to communicate with workers around the country, in which case you might have a tie. So the problem is that, uh, as with all good research, it throws up new questions, which is it highlights the importance of curriculum variation and the importance of trying to figure out how to weight gains in different dimensions, which we're not able to do. But even without that, you can clearly infer that the private schools are more productive. Uh, and the way you can see that is that they could deliver the same test scores in math and Telugu with considerably less time and use the extra productivity to deliver better outcomes on other subjects, okay? So, which is why the way I summarize this is saying that the private schools were not much more effective in the basic subjects, but they're considerably more productive, but they choose to use that productivity in a different place. Okay, and that's, that's exactly what I just said. So, uh, but the, but the comparison is rendered even more stark when you then look at the cost effectiveness comparison, okay? Which is uh, the private schools are spending less than one third per child as what the government schools are spending, and the value of the voucher is only about 40% of the per child spending in the government school. So if you think about this then from a public finance perspective, then it's almost unambiguous that the private schools are considerably more productive because they're getting you uh, slightly better test scores, right? Uh, if you weight the subject equally uh, and at much lower cost, okay? So here's kind of the tables very quickly. So this is at the end of two years, uh, and you see the average across the three subjects, uh, the effect is a big fat zero, okay? Uh, but then you go look at the timetable, and you, it's really quite stunning, okay? So this is instructional time per week, and you see that uh, the private schools spend 200 minutes a week less on Telugu, about 160 minutes less than that, more time in English, science, and social studies, uh, but the big increase is in Hindi, which is not taught in the public schools. Uh, they also teach a little bit more of computer and other stuff, but we're not even measuring those guys, okay? So then when you go back and test in all these subjects, uh, you see, right, uh, that English and social studies are positive, uh, not significant, okay, but Hindi is where you get big positive effects. And when you average this across the subjects, you get a positive significant effect of about 0.23 standard English. So the next question then is how do the impact vary by student and market characteristics? And so we don't find much variation by student characteristics, but the big and really interesting one here is mm, we find potentially very important differences by medium of instruction of the private school. So what you see is that switching to an English medium private school led to worse scores on Telugu, Math, and EDS, but much better scores in English and Hindi. Uh, where switching to a telephone medium private school got you better outcomes in all subjects, uh, but of course less than English medium schools in English and Hindi. So what this suggests is that switching medium of instruction may have very significant costs in accumulation of content knowledge for the economically weaker students who are first generation learners migrating from the public schools. But it also suggests that the private schools will be even more effective uh, when the students do not undergo a disruption to the medium of instruction. Now, the reason uh, this will eventually just be an appendix in the paper and not like in the main paper is this result is not as precise, okay? And because even when you have a randomized voucher program, you can randomize which kid gets a voucher, 
but he cannot randomize which school they go to, okay? And so the way you get this credible estimate of language comes from an instrument available estimate that is using the distance of the nearest private, distance, the language of the nearest private school as an instrument for the language of instruction of the school you attend. So I don't know what the technical distribution of the audience is, but the bottom line is that these results are just not as precise. But we put it out there because there's so little good work on medium of instruction that we want to put it out there as suggestive evidence that a lot more research is needed in this area. There's also some evidence of positive effects of data choice and competition, which is you get variation across village size and number of schools in the village. And it looks like that the villages that have four or five or more schools in one kilometer radius have bigger gains, suggesting that there might be some positive effects of choice and competition. But again, the project is not set up to study that because uh, the villages don't really have as many schools as you would find in that urban setting. So I'm going to try and wrap up because uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of results. And then the spillovers, uh, the big news is that, uh, to use Sherlock Holmes' words, I mean, this is the dog that did not bark, okay? So everybody's out there concerned about these spillovers. Uh, but we just find no negative effects or on any of these groups, okay? And so it suggests that the concerns about quality dilution in private schools have been driven by a very small fraction of elite schools in major metros, whereas in a representative sample of private schools in the country, we're not really finding any negative effects. Uh, but one caveat is that the average share of the voucher students was about 25% of the sending schools, but only about 8% of the receiving schools. So if the law is implemented in steady state, you might see a larger fraction. So, I mean, obviously this is not like a full-scale replication of the scaled up law, but it does suggest uh, that these negative spillover effects are unlikely to, uh, to, to show up in practice. Okay. Now, of course, the results could also reflect efforts made by the schools to integrate these voucher students effectively, and so sometimes they provide extra classes for the first few weeks and months to help them integrate. Uh, but it's important to see why they do this. They do this because they value the voucher money, they value the, uh, and they know that if the kids are not happy, they're going to go back. So there's certainly a certain element in which the provision of the voucher and purchasing power to the poor kids makes the schools responsive to this. Okay, and in fact, almost all the private schools were really, really happy to participate in the project, mainly because they trusted the foundation would make their payments on time. And in fact, that made it quite valuable because even with their typical private school students, I meaning families would sometimes not be able to pay. Okay, so the important lesson here is that school integration across socioeconomic classes was achieved at no cost to existing students in the private schools, and you got some improvements in the private schools. Okay, so these are those spillover results. So look, focus on column four and nine, which combines across the subjects. And you see that if you look at the, at the lottery losers in the treatment villages, the non-applicants in the government schools, and the, non the initial private school students. So if you go back to the picture, those four groups I drew, there's no uh, significant spillovers on any of these groups. So I've already talked about cost effectiveness, and um, you know, I'm going to go through this quickly, right? Um, so private schools spend less and deliver more value addition, but the value addition is only slight. So what are the policy implications? So the summary of the results are that the private schools are more productive and much more cost effective, but they got the same scores with less time, and they use the extra time to raise test scores in other subjects, and they cost about one third the child. No significant spillovers. And this is important for both the RTE Act as well as the global literature. So there's a nice paper looking at school integration across races in the US and uh, the medical program uh, that finds similarly no effects on the kids who were in the private schools or the more um, in the more uh, privileged socioeconomic districts. Uh, and so more generally for the global literature and school choice, uh, for those of you around the world who are conducting similar studies around in other settings, I think it really highlights the importance of accounting for school time use in studies of school choice and vouchers and charter schools in general. So for example, our inference of the effectiveness of schools would have been mistaken without accounting for the differential patterns of time use. And so it suggests that the existing literature might do well to go back and look at this issue. Okay? So for example, voucher studies might be understating gains if, for example, the private schools are doing other things, and charter studies could be overstating the gains if the charter schools are very sharply focused on improving test scores in math and language and are diluting attention from other subjects. So there's two suggestive heterogeneity results. Okay? Both are less robust than the main ones, so these are caveated, but potentially important. Uh, the first is the heterogeneity by language instruction, and the second is by choice and competence. So the implications for policy, 
is that this right to education provision could be one of the very rare policies that can improve equity and efficiency and do so at a lower cost than the status quo. Uh, you see the test score gains for the winners, no negative effect on the losers. And there's a very nice new job market paper uh, dissertation by Gautam Rao of Berkeley, where he looks at cohorts in Delhi that were exposed to the program and not. So it's not experimental, but he's able to get some very nice measures of attitudes and behavior. And he's in fact finding positive effects on the elite kids in the private school in terms of their uh, pro-social behavior, their uh, participation in charitable activity, and they're less likely to engage in this community against the core. So it does suggest that, you know, this is a policy, that the history of the policy is something that it brought, it came from the left who wanted to kind of achieve more social economic education, but was then supported by the right as a way of achieving more school choice for the poor. And this might be one of these rare policies where both sides are right um, and that you can do this at lower cost than the status quo because the reimbursement of the private schools is capped at the per child spending. Now, there's three important caveats. Uh, the first is that the learning outcomes in private schools may be higher if they have the same level of per child spending, but we have no evidence of this, okay? So there's no evidence that spending more money or increasing the spending by factor of three will give you more outcomes. So it's possible that the private schools might choose to spend that money on flashy buildings and attracting parents and not on improving test scores. So we don't know that. Uh, there is a bit of a trade-off here, right, between kind of the more uh, libertarian approaches to school choice that parents know best and a more paternalistic one that says they might not make the right choices. So one example here is on the medium of instruction. Okay, So we do believe anecdotally and a lot of qualitative evidence that parents believe that English medium schools are kind of the best for their kids, but it's possible that you might be better off being taught in the native language for first generation learners and learning English as a subject. So, you know, you need two sides of the school choice argument. One is productivity and the other is effective choice, and it's possible that uh, that, that might not be as effective if we don't have evidence. Right? Uh, and right, so it's interesting to think about why private schools choose the curriculum they do. Why do they <clears throat> teach Hindi as opposed to teaching uh, just more basic competencies in, in the basic language? And it's possible that they're responding to market pressures. And it's also possible that the benefits of these voucher and choice based programs can be completely eroded if the schools are allowed to select the kids. So there's a nice theory paper that shows how important it is uh, to have lots of data. So the larger implications for public and private debate, I would say, are a little mixed. I think both sides need to exercise some caution. So for those who are kind of on the private school bandwagon and saying, hey, listen, you know, all the parents are going there, it must be better, it is important to keep in mind that the private schools did not do better <coughs> at value addition and math and political. So in particular, <coughs> it highlights the importance of the experiment, because if you look at the cross-sectional difference, it shows that almost all of this cross-sectional difference is driven by socioeconomic factors. Uh, they do work harder, okay? So this is very clear and unambiguously established. I mean, that they have a longer school year, longer school day, lower teacher absence, more time on task. But it's possible that the binding constraint education quality might be something like pedagogy or something like the tyranny of the textbook, which other J. affiliates have talked about. Uh, and the other challenge in private schools is that the private schools are too fragmented. So if uh, one of the advantages of public schools is if you have research that says a particular technique is effective, there's a way of channeling that learning down the chain of, of the public schools, but it's very hard to do that with private schools because they're too fragmented. Um, and parental choice is maybe suboptimal because the feedback loop is too long. At the same time, uh, for those who think that the answer to all the education problems is just pumping more money into the public schooling system, uh, there's also important caveats here, which is that qualification is not quality, okay? So the public school teachers are more qualified, much better paid, have better, uh, have more experience, uh, but if they don't show up or the effort levels are low, that's not going to be the outcomes. And the private schools are able to achieve the same outcomes at one third the cost, okay? So then the fundamental public finance question becomes, in a world of limited fiscal capacity, is what could private management achieve with the same level of spending? And so what it points to is the importance of moving away, I think, from public versus private debates, which are a little too simplistic, uh, and partly because there's an enormous amount of variation. So there's good public schools and not so good public schools. There's good private schools and not so good private schools. And so I think what's really important is to move the discussion to the design of education systems uh, that can leverage the strengths of both public and private while mitigating against the weakness of the other while also paying attention to cost effectiveness. And so system design really matters, and that's kind of where my research and working with the government and aspects of implementation are moving forward. And this is what the Nobel Prize for Algorithm was awarded last year. So this is kind of a really important area for future research. So um, sorry for going a few minutes over, and we stop there.
Great. Thank you very much, Kartik. Um, and uh, at this point, we'll take uh, questions from everyone who's listening in. As a reminder, um, you can submit questions by uh, hovering your mouse over the green bar that you see at the top of your screen. Uh, then click chat and enter your question. And I will read questions out loud for Kartik. Um, we may not have time to get to everyone's questions, but I will try to bring out the topics that are being raised frequently. Um, and as the moderator, I will uh, take uh, the first question for myself. Um, Kartik, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, the extent to which you think your results will generalize uh, now that the right to education mandate is, is expanding um, this uh, these share of the private school population for, for um, lower income children, particularly thinking about different re states and regions of India, but also rural versus urban and um, having it be rolled out by, by a government rather than by a foundation. Great. So these are all excellent questions. Um, and I think, I, I mean, so, the, so, so the, the short answer is to say that I think a lot of the basic dynamics that we're finding here in Andhra Pradesh are definitely similar to what we see in other parts of India. So uh, we have all India data on public versus private schools in terms of just the inputs, uh, and we also have other, uh, you know, other evidence from this from uh, from other surveys. But across the board, I think we do find these patterns apply. The public private school teachers are less qualified; uh, they're paid a lot less. Uh, but uh, because of that, the schools hire more of them and so you have lower class sizes, and because uh, they're more accountable, you typically get higher level of effort. Now, now obviously, like I mean, in RTE, everything depends on implementation. So you know, all bets are off with regard to. So, for example, um, you can easily see how a system where the schools are allowed to cherry pick the kids and then you don't have a centralized or uh, transparent system of allocation leads to an enormous amount of irregularities in who, in fact, gets these slots in the private school. And there's already a lot of anecdotal evidence that the implementation is uh, is quite haphazard. And that's why I wrote this two part series of kind of extended op-eds for Ideas for India, and partly laying out an implementation protocol, which I think is consistent with best practices, uh, but I think the implementation is going to be a bit important. Uh, and finally, I think, you know, maybe uh, the results will be a little different in states where you don't have a free language formula. So if you go to the Northern Belt, where it's only Hindi and English, as opposed to Telugu, Hindi, and English, uh, the, the, the results might be different, and which is why what I hope to do is kind of build and put in place a multi-year, multi-site research effort to track the impacts of RTE plus 12 or as they're being rolled out across the country. Okay. Um, Eliza uh, was wondering if you could comment on um, the results of your study in light of uh, the results from another randomized experiment on vouchers in private schools uh, in Columbia, uh, which is by uh, Michael Creamer, who's another JPAL affiliate, um, Josh Angrist and, and co-authors. and. Just for everyone else who's on the line, and Kartik, you can you can add anything you think is relevant. Um, this was a voucher experiment for private secondary schools where they tracked uh, the the voucher winners over many years and found um, a, a large range of positive effects, both academically and in terms of labor market outcomes and other outcomes. So um, the the question is, do, do the results of your study complement or reinforce or differ from the results of of that study? Right. So that's a, that's a great question, right? So it, I mean. The only experimental evidence we have of vouchers in developing countries so far is, is the Columbia one. So there's many strengths in that program. And in particular, what I like a lot about it is that was a scaled up nationwide program that over 100,000 kids applied, or there were about 100,000 vouchers, and they've now tracked outcomes long term, including labor market outcomes and high school completion. So you really know the program did have an effect. Um, I think the main caveat is the interpretation because the design of the program was different in two important ways. The first is that parents were allowed to top up the voucher and pay more out of pocket and therefore kind of upgrade the quality of school they went to. Uh, the second and perhaps more important one is that the students were required to maintain a minimum grade that can mean for the continuation of the voucher from year to year. And so, and they were, you know, supposed to not repeat and stuff like that. And so that also created student level incentives for higher effort. So I think that program was obviously very, very effective. But it's a little tricky to interpret the findings as purely reflecting, say, the effectiveness of private schools, because there's also elements of student incentive built into that program. So 
And I think, you know, if you compare results from other settings where Michael Kramer and Rebecca Thornton and Ted Miguel did a study of student incentives in Kenya, they found the student incentives had a big positive effect. Uh, whereas other studies of kind of comparing public and private schools have typically not found effects in other settings. So it kind of leads to a sense that the student incentives might have been a non trivial component of what was going on in Colombia. But of course, there's a lot of other pieces to this as well, including the ability to take vocational schools. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the way to think about that study and that program is highlights the potential of um, private schools and, and vouchers combined with aspects of student incentives to give you good long-term effects. And what we're doing here is trying to isolate the pure productivity effect of the private schools, but in a setting where in the Indian policy setting, the RTE is not talking about um, minimum grades or minimum uh, achievement for continuation in the private schools. So in that sense, both the studies are doing the right thing of designing it as relevant to the policy environment in the country in which it's being implemented. So I think what's generalizable are the principles, right, mean that time use really matters, accounting for cost really matters, and looking at the whole range of subjects and outcomes is important, but at the same time, uh, the cross-sectional differences are perhaps not driven by productivity as much as by social economic status. Great. Uh, here's a question from Tom. Um, you wanted to know, can we presume that teaching in the mother tongue is better than in Hindi or English for math? No, so I think, you know, I, I certainly would not want people to kind of walk away from the presentation as saying that we've got conclusive evidence of that. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's a really difficult question to answer. So I'm not aware of any credible experimental study uh, that is able to look at the impact of language and instruction, partly because it's not feasible to randomize, because that would be ethically permissible to randomize the medium of instruction. So you would need to come up with other roundabout ways of doing that. So, I mean, I have seen some work in Ethiopia recently uh, that showed that when they moved uh, to teaching in the native language, um, that as children kind of spent an extra year, completed an extra year in school. So it does suggest that for first generation learners in particular, uh, that being taught in the native language would uh, mean would help content knowledge accumulation. So, and this is consistent with the cognitive neuroscience literature. So I think that, um, Helen Abadzi has a 2006 book, uh, Synthesizing Learning from Cognitive Neuroscience for Education in Low-Income Settings. And one of her strong recommendations is that for first-generation learners, um, that initial instruction should take place in the native language because of the importance of reinforcement at home. So I would take our results as suggestive in that same direction, but certainly not a conclusive piece of evidence on that piece because, like I said, you can't randomize the native instruction. Thank you. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone listening, you can send in questions for Tartik um, at any time, and I'm, I'm reading a, a selection of them. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll have time for all of the questions that everyone is sending in. But uh, if, if Kartik is willing and everyone else is willing, we might go a few minutes over since we did start um, five minutes late. Uh, the next question is from Lisa, and she wanted to know if you could speak a bit more about how the tests were designed to measure the learning uh, impacts accurately. And how important was the test design to the reliability of your results? So that's, again, uh, a great question. And so the tests that we are using are designed by India's leading test design firm. Um, so they're called Education Initiatives. And they have worked with us for over eight years in this process in designing these tests based on um, so a full analysis of the curriculum and a mapping of the competencies um, into what you're expected to know. but. One important thing in the test is that we end up actually providing, you know, overweighting content from lower grades, and partly because everybody is so far behind their grade appropriate level that if you were to give a fifth grade test to fifth graders, uh, the average score would be a zero. Uh, and then, you know, you wouldn't really pick up anything meaningful if there is, in fact, a movement from, say, grade two level to grade three level. So that the tests are spanned to include difficulties across the entire concept, but they're much richer tests than kind of, you know, so Prakam and Uwezo and others use a very simple test, which is a useful kind of dipstick measure of whether kids are able to read and write. Uh, but this is a much, much more detailed test. And so in each subject, the testing is, <coughs> ranges from about 30 to 50 questions of testing uh, across the range of competencies and <coughs> also covering competencies from earlier grades. So in that sense, I mean, um, Treatment effects and standard deviations can be quite sensitive uh, to the range of the difficulty of the questions, and we've tried to be as representative of the range of questions as possible. 
And so, so, so the only exception to that was the Hindi test. Okay, so the the Hindi test was done using the Pratham test, and the Hindi test is done on a smaller representative sample, uh, and that's done using an individual oral test. And that's because um, because the public schools don't teach Hindi. Uh, you have uh, you know kids do know Hindi because uh, they pick it up from Hindi movies and they pick it up from from friends and family. So it's not that they don't know it, uh, but we couldn't administer a written test there. So that's administered using the Pratham instrument. But the other subjects have very fully fleshed out detailed tests. Great. Uh, our next question is about um, not just the, uh, the, I guess, the levels of the private schools and all of the characteristics you mentioned, but also the variability. Uh, was there a lot of variability in the private schools in terms of uh, leadership, teacher competency, number of schools, uh, whether they were uh, franchises, for example? Right. So that's a great question, right? Uh, and so, you know, so one of the, what would have been really nice, I mean, is to have a bunch of schools that were you know, spending a fair bit of more money and spending something equal to the per child cost in the government schools so that we could then just get a clean test of management of, of quality holding holding all the input costs. So, uh, so just like I explained with the language, I mean, there is a problem in evaluating as a function of school characteristics because you don't randomize the school that the child goes to. Okay, so there is uh, a trade-off, obviously, between access and uh, between distance and scale. So some of the better schools might be further away, but then kids might not go there because that's a further distance. So it's a it's it's a long way of answering your question of saying yes, there is variation, right? I mean, so we document a substantial amount of variation in in the fees uh, and and in PPRs and in some of these key inputs, but it's kind of hard to use that as a way of analyzing outcomes because that is a choice variable and not randomly assigned. So there is another study which I think uh, in other JPAL affiliates, uh, Esther Duplo and Pascal Dupin, I think Michael Kramer are doing in Kenya, which is a long-term study of a girl's scholarship scheme. And I think one of, uh, I don't think the results are out yet, but one of the interesting things in their design is that lottery is a school level lottery, right? So you have excess demand in each school. And then what you can do is you can look at whether the effects of winning the lottery are different in schools that are of better quality as rated by some of these more uh, qualitative measures of school quality. And that's a study that will be able to do that. So in our setting, what I can tell you is there is variation, but we cannot credibly uh, experimentally tell you whether that variation is correlated with effectiveness. Right, and here's here's a quick follow-up question: Is the variation in government schools comparable to that in the private school universe, or is uh, the gov are the government sector schools more consistent? So that's a great question. So they're certainly they're much more consistent in terms of time loops, right? That can mean that the patterns are very very similar. Um, uh, but there is variation in terms of the experience profiles, and that's basically because nobody wants to be posted in more remote areas. So you'll find that the more senior teachers, the more experience, typically get better postings in terms of proximity to facilities and stuff like that. Uh, and the more remote areas are typically staffed with the more junior teachers. Uh, but most of this variation is then driven by variation in access and proximity. Um, so to answer the earlier question, the other thing that we're not seeing yet is there aren't really franchises or chains out there just yet. Uh, but one of the hopes is that what RTE Plus will do is by bringing on board like a steady, so in, in an ideal world, we would like to not just look at the static impact of school choice, but the dynamic impact of saying, what does this do in the long run entry and exit of schools? And that's clearly not something we could do because the private foundation, the Lagarden Institute and Foundation that was funding the vouchers could only do this for two cohorts of kids. And so you would need to do this on an ongoing basis for posterity uh, for private schools to new private schools and higher cost private schools to say, okay, I have enough commitment in terms of a market size able to pay for me to come in. So um, that would be a fascinating and important question to look at in the context of RT cost well, but that's not something we can look at just yet. Kartik, you mentioned earlier um, you were discussing the spillover effects or perhaps the lack of spillover effects on the students who were in the private schools who were um, having the, this new influx of, of lower income classmates. Um, were there any spillover effects of onto uh, children left behind in the public schools from those classmates disappearing into the private system? Uh, no, so there were none there, and I'm sorry I had to go through this quickly. But in fact, that ta uh, that table. So if you hang on, let me just go back to right there. Uh, get you here, okay? Right. So are, are you seeing my screen? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. So if you look at panel A, right, so uh, panel A is looking at the spillovers on the kids who applied and lost the lottery, right, I mean, across the treatment and control villages. Panel B is what you're asking about, which is the non-applicants from the government schools, right? That can mean, so that's group one, and you see that the net effect there is also pretty much zero. And panel C are the spillovers from the kids who started out in the private schools, and even that uh, basically looks like zero. Right. Okay, great. Um, if anyone would like to send in um, one more question, we'll we'll try to do a couple more really quickly. Another question from Andrew. Um, were the schools studied uh, government or government-aided schools, and was there a difference in results between those subgroups of public schools? Uh, right, so that's a good question. And it turns out that the government-aided schools are just not that big a factor in Andhra Pradesh. So in states like Kerala, they constitute a very large fraction of, of, of the schools, uh, in which case they're kind of quasi-public and quasi-private. Uh, but in our setting, almost all the private school studies are uh, essentially you know, private management with no government support, and all the government school studies are government in, government administered, government run uh, schools uh, in, uh, in in rural Andhra Pradesh. All right. Um, unfortunately, I think that's all the time that we have. I'd like to thank Kartik for sharing his research with us today. Uh, Luke Strathman, who's uh, the coordinator of JPAL's research webinar series, and of course all of you for joining us and sending in your great questions. Uh, we'll post the video from today on our YouTube channel in a few weeks, and if you have any feedback on the webinar, we'd love to hear it. And you can share it by email at webinar at povertyactionlab.org. And to hear about other upcoming research webinars and other news from JPAL, we encourage you to visit our website, uh, subscribe to our monthly e-news, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks again.